Hello and welcome. My name is Jessica Adelman. I am the Social Media and Communications Manager for the Ehlers Danlos Society, and I will be your moderator today. For our webinar today, we have Dr. James Black presenting on vascular management and the Ehlers Danlos Syndromes. This webinar is part of our ongoing series, Living with EDS and HSD. A quick note about how this webinar is going to work. Attendees are muted at all times. However, you are able to type questions into the question box at any time. Dr. Black will not be able to see or respond to any questions until the Q&A time at the end of his presentation. Please do not send your questions more than once as it will not increase the chance your question will be answered. It will only make it harder for us to sift through the questions. Dr. Black is the Chief Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Therapy at Johns Hopkins Hospital and the David Goldfarb Associate Professor of Surgery at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Black is an expert in the application of endovascular technology for patients with aortic and vascular disease, and he has unique expertise on open surgical reconstruction for connective tissue disorders. To the subject of aortic disease, he has given invited lectures to the White House Medical Unit and the FDA section in charge of cardiovascular devices. His research interests include the molecular events underpinning the development of aortic catastrophe in both atherosclerotic and genetic arthropathies. Thank you so much, Dr. Back, for being with us here today. All right. Well, thank you for the uh, invitation and uh, w welcome to those attendees who are uh, uh, listening along. Um, the purpose of the talk today was to get a general, uh, general overview of some of the vascular issues that patients will encounter um, among all the different subtypes of uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So um, this is something that I've been working on um, in, as part of my practice here for the better part of the last uh, uh, 15 years or so. And some of the insights that you'll hear today are from my experiences managing patients. And, and I've sort of uh, been able to deal with the vast majority of arterial and venous problems with people uh, that they can develop inside uh, EDS. You know, as a general overview, uh, for EDS, uh, of course, we all understand that these are hereditary connective tissue disorders, and mutations in the genes appear to regulate how our collagen matrix functions. And for those who don't have the deep dive on biochemistry, the structural proteins that are responsible for our joints and our bones and our arteries are a mix of, of collagen and elastin. Um, collagen is what's thought to be affected um, uh, most in the Ehlers-Danlos subtypes. And then indeed, there are six different EDS subtypes that have vascular manifestations. Uh, classical, hypermobile, vascular, of course, uh, kyphoscoliotic, anthroclassic, and dermatosporadic um, all have vascular manifestations. However, um, it's really the classical, the hypermobile, and the vascular subtypes where we see vascular problems. Um, it's relatively rare in classical and hypermobile, but certainly can still occur. Um, and of course, vascular, the vascular manifestations essentially define the uh, um, subtype in that regard. Um, in general, though, all of these patients among all these different subtypes are characterized by joint hypermobility, skin hyperextensibility, as well as tissue fragility. And you know, some of those manifestations I have uh, here on those pictures you see, um, such as the subcutaneous veins, thin skin, stretchable skin, the hypermobile joints. And then on the screen right is a picture of a liver um, with a aneurysm, um, which has caused the liver to split. And that's a patient who got into trouble with uh, bleeding in the liver who had vascular EDS. Um, my general impression of this entire field um, was that the spectrum of arterial and venous anomalies, including uh, spontaneous dissection of arteries or rupture of arteries was generally underreported in the non-vascular EDS uh, subtypes. And, and unfortunately, the surgical experience of vascular EDS patients, which is known to be a very difficult uh, group to manage and a difficult group for successful surgery, is often taken as representative of all the subtypes of EDS. And of course, that's really unfair because historically speaking, although the operative mortalities were very high and there was a concern about morbidities or complications after surgery, um, to sort of withhold um, elective procedures um, from patients who have EDS, um, particularly those who don't have vascular EDS, uh, thinking that they would behave clinically um, with extreme tissue fragility and difficulty with vascular procedures um, was really unfair across the board. Of course, it's unfair to the surgeons in the middle of the night to be confronted with vascular ruptures because procedures have been held off from patients. And, and of course, the patients suffer too because there are things we can do to help people um, get through their conditions. <clears throat> 
Um, and I think what really changed, and this is sort of where I sort of stepped into the field of vascular surgery, was that we didn't have to do surgery with incisions. We could oftentimes get away with doing procedures to help the blood vessels or take care of ruptures or dissections just using catheters. And those procedures are called endovascular procedures. They're very similar to cardiac catheterizations where the puncture and the entry into the artery might be in the groin or at the wrist. And then using the blood vessel as a highway, you can bring yourself using catheters and wires up to the area of concern and, and deal with it with a stent or a wire or a coil to stop bleeding or handle uh, aneurysm. So here's a good example of that. This is a, um, a young woman who a few weeks postpartum had neck pain and has what appears to be a rupture of the artery uh, feeding up the right side of the neck to the brain. Um, this is a carotid artery and certainly from the standpoint of an experienced surgeon, um, I would know that there would be no way for me to get into this artery um, in terms of a surgical exposure without risking a major stroke um, or major bleeding. Um, and But with the endovascular procedures and a more minimally invasive approach, we can come from the groin into the artery and the um, um, you know, here at the bottom, of, you can appreciate a catheter sitting inside the base of the neck, and then through there, we bring a stent and a whole bunch of metal coils uh, into that aneurysm and cause the oil to uh, cause the aneurysm to basically clot off. Um, and this has been many, many years since this procedure is done, and I still see this patient who's still doing very, very well. Here's another example of a very, very difficult surgical problem, which is an abnormal connection due to vascular rupture between the arteries and veins in the abdomen of a patient with vascular uh, EDS. And certainly we all have heard that the arteries can be fragile um, in EDS, but the veins can be even more tricky. So to get in there and try and separate those two structures and fix them could be a really, really difficult procedure. But with a catheter, and here the patient's actually lying on her tummy, and we basically access one of the blood vessels that feeds out to the buttock, and then come through there with catheters and wires and seal off the abnormal connection between the arteries and the veins. And, and as it was with this case, um, uh, other than a little bit of a sore bottom, she was able to go home a day or two later. But surgery would have been a real, real difficult uh, proposition and probably a long time in the hospital. Um, so across the board, we've treated a number of patients. Um, uh, and this slide is a little bit uh, out of date, but the, the punchline being the same across the EDS subtypes, mostly classical, hypermobile, and vascular subtypes is where we see this. Typical of patients with EDS, there's a family history, um, and usually around 31% of people. There may be a history of sudden death in the family, and it's very difficult, of course, to, to assign sudden death events to um, uh, EDS uh, unless we really, really dive into those family histories, and that's something where a genetic counselor um, or an experienced practitioner who deals with patients who have connective tissue disorders would be of value to um, almost all of our patients. Um, for our endovascular procedures, you can see most of these are performed electively. These are the sort of operations that people come in, um, meet the team, they get our best anesthesia team, our, our best um, surgical teams, um, and doing these procedures by the light of day is really an important uh, notion because, of course, when procedures are done in the middle of the night, it's much, much harder to have the same good outcomes. It's not just about the surgical experience of the team, but it's also about the nurses and, and the anesthesiologists. You see um, angioplasty, um, that is stretching of a blood vessel or putting in a stent uh, is performed in the classical and hypermobiles, but for the most part, the vascular yes patients almost entirely are getting embolizations, which means essentially clotting off the vessels where there's dissections or ruptures so that those vessels no longer um, experience uh, normal blood flow and therefore the arteries will hold up uh, over, uh, better over time um, and have a lower risk for rupture. Um, many of the patients, um, when the procedures are for classical or hypermobile, we can do those procedures under local uh, anesthesia or even just a little bit of sedation or what we call twilight anesthesia. Uh, but for vascular EDS, far more of the patients will be under general anesthesia, and that's just to help manage blood pressure, uh, help control pain, um, and set uh, a situation in place that would be most safe to have their procedure done without uh, major complications. Um, for our endovascular procedures, uh, you can see here that um, we have not had anyone pass away. Um, the length of stays are quite reasonable and the complication rates are very low. Remember, 
endovascular procedures don't include any major incisions. It's a, usually just a puncture in the groin uh, or the wrist to access the blood vessels and deal with whatever vascular territory we need to deal with, with coils or wires or stents. And of course, that's a much easier proposition than open surgery. We have certainly performed quite a number of open procedures on people with classic and hypermobile and vascular DS uh, also here at Hopkins. Uh, but those are more difficult procedures. I'm still largely quite safe um, in all the subtypes, but we have had patients pass away in the vascular EDS group. And in this case, it was a 30-ish um, uh, uh, year old woman who had an aortic dissection soon after pregnancy um, and the tissues just wouldn't hold up to anything. And unfortunately she passed away. A question I receive quite often about um, management of blood vessels is, can we use stents to solve vascular problems in patients with Ehlers-Danlos? Um, you have to remember, um, in using stents to treat aneurysms, which is how we use them mostly in modern vascular surgery, none of the devices were ever trialed in patients who had connective tissue disorders. In fact, any form of a connective tissue disorder, whether it was vascular EDS, EDS, Marfan's, lowes dietz syndrome, familial aneurysms, any of those led to exclusion of the patient from the trial. So essentially none of the devices out on the market anywhere in the world have ever been tried consistently or uniformly on patients with a connective tissue disorder. The concern being that the devices do exert a radial force on the blood vessel. The devices are made of metal, so they have a tendency to straighten. And there's very few blood vessels in the human body that are completely straight. And also some of the stents um, uh, not only have fabric around them, which is called a stent graft, but they're also bare metal stents where the metal itself is hitting the blood vessel wall. And the concern other also being that the vessel wall may be fragile. So there can be trauma induced into the wall from the stent. You can have a tear, what we call retrograde, which means the tear starts near the edge of the stent itself and then runs back towards the heart. And then of course, where your stent might look okay, beyond it, the aorta remote to where the stent is can still have problems over time. And here's a couple pictures of patients who had stents. Um, one here is a stent graft on a patient with a connective tissue disorder where the stent is actually popped out the top of the aortic arch and a second stent is actually putting, being put in place to salvage that situation. Here on the bottom screen is a picture of a stent completely outside the aorta, the stent uh, graft, that is the stent with the fabrics around it, the graft fabric, is still in the blood vessel, but the bare, bare metal stent is complete, completely pushed out of the aortic arch. Um, and that's something we've been uh, watching for and, and monitoring for this patient for several years, knowing that the operation to deal with that was going to be very, very difficult. So how do we address these types of procedures? So in the operating room, um, uh, is where we bring all of our patients, uh, plus or minus general anesthesia, mostly depending upon subtype. But it bears worth mentioning that for a patient who has a connective tissue disorder, it is certainly worthwhile to consider having your procedure done preferentially in a hospital and not any surgery center um, uh, or a ambulatory surgery center where they wouldn't have the full capabilities of a hospital to handle bleeding complications, anesthetic complications, um, and, uh, and other things that can occur in the operating room. So having hospital support around these procedures is certainly important. In the operating room, we really try to control the patient's blood pressure. When the blood pressure is high, these catheters have a tendency to whip around inside the blood vessels. Um, that can lead to all sorts of trouble in terms of creating tears in the vessels or ruptures. Um, and so in fact, a lot of our patients, particularly for vascular EDS, we will medically induce low blood pressure to reduce the torque and the whip that's happening inside the um, inside the um, blood vessels themselves. There are blood vessels that we know in, in vascular DS, um, as well as other subtypes that tend to be uh, very fragile. And that can include your celiac vessels, which is a vessel that feeds off of the aorta towards the liver and the stomach. The other is the external iliac artery, which is a vessel that feeds from the, um, uh, about your belly button down to the groin. Um, and, uh, um, and traversing these vessels is uh, something that has to be done very carefully. And of course, all of these procedures are done under x-ray guidance. So we actually see the wires and the catheters moving through the vessels under live action as we're doing the procedure. So there are a couple of recommendations that have come to pass uh, concerning uh, vascular EDS and apply really across the board to the other EDS subtypes. And I, I certainly believe that a multidisciplinary evaluation 
prior to any form of elective surgery is important. And it's not just to meet your surgeons and, and meet your team, but also just to have them consider the uh, risk of excess tissue fragility. There are things that go into tissue fragility, such as age, family history, what type of procedure you have to do that are important to, to um, uh, consider. And those are conversations that should happen with you and your surgeon, uh, with your family present, so that everyone is on the same page. Um, invasive procedures, as I mentioned, um, should certainly be performed in the hospital setting versus office and surgery centers. So you wanna have vascular surgery capabilities available on the premises. So you know, even for example, our patients with um, VDS or EDS who are having uh, gynecologic procedures, um, or even breast biopsies um, are still done in the hospital with the vascular surgeons, at least made aware that the procedure is happening um, and uh, they're around should issues come up. Uh, embolization techniques are really considered preferentially over stent grafts um, when uh, it's anatomically feasible. So there are situations where clotting off a blood vessel um, using embolization techniques to, to take away the blood supply of that area and reduce the risk for rupture is not technically feasible, such as whether an artery going to the brain or an artery going to your hand. Um, you know, those things um, uh, are situations where we have to default to stent grafts, and stent grafts need to be uh, watched very, very closely. So when stent grafts are used, which is recommendation number four, they really should be used preferentially for a life-threatening situation um, where um, the patient's at immediate risk um, or um, a organ could be lost if not um, uh, reconstructed immediately with a stent or a surgery. Um, open surgery for vascular DS um, should be considered in experience centers for young patients, particularly if they have a favorable surgical history or if they have a particular type of mutation in the collagen 3A1 gene. We know that these haploinsufficient mutations and the collagen 3A1 gene are favorable for surgery. Um, the tissue fragility on patients is not as severe as it is with uh, more classic missense mutations or substitution mutations where the entire collagen molecule is degraded. So again, working with an experienced team, working with your genetics counselor to drill down um, on the uh, types of mutations can be informative and help to point a way to a more safe surgery. Uh, hernia repair, is a very common operation for people with EDS, as we believe the tissues are extensible and somewhat prone to hernia, hernia formation or tissue tearing. Uh, hernia repair certainly should include mesh uh, as well as other adjuncts to the primary repair. So a primary repair is essentially just reopposing the tissues and excising the tissues which are of poor quality. Um, doing a primary repair alone for an EDS patient or vascular death patient with a hernia is never going to work. You need additional mechanical support with the mesh or other what we call bioprosthetic uh, items. Um, colon ruptures um, uh, are seen rarely in patients with vascular DS, but they really should be treated with resection of that piece of the colon and then a colostomy just to uh, get out of the woods, so to speak. Later on, um, the uh, colostomy can be considered um, to, for reversal, um, but it's a, a question that really comes down to the surgeon and their experience with tissue fragility. Um, for patients um, who have a, uh, um, who present with a bowel rupture, who have diverticula or weakness of the colon throughout the entire course of the colon from right to left, not just the usual spot, which is the left, but both right-sided and left-sided uh, diverticula, a total abdominal colectomy can be considered. Uh, for uh, patients, and that is a reasonable option if there is a strong history of, uh, of a colon rupture in the family. So that's my general overview of the subject. Um, I uh, told the team I'd probably go about 20 minutes, and that's pretty much exactly what I've done. I'm happy to field the questions now if there are any from the audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Bach. We do have some questions in, and if you have any more questions, we've got plenty of time, so get in and get your questions in and we'll get to as many as possible. Our first question is, are there any natural or chemical interventions to help strengthen or even heal weakened vessels? Uh, yes, yeah, so there are, um, there are things we can do that are definitely um, uh, good for our blood vessels. So um, if I had to make one admonition uh, for anyone with a connective tissue disorder is certainly not to smoke. Um, smoking is, um, 
uh, terribly, terribly um, damaging to the natural biology of a blood vessel wall. It's not just the coronary vessels. It could be um, the vessels in the brain, the neck, the abdomen, the legs. Uh, so, uh, so yes, avoidance of smoking is key. Um, a uh, statin medication, um, those things like such as uh, Lipitor, um, Simvastatin, if someone has a family history of coronary artery disease um, and their cholesterol is running high, um, then those medications are absolutely uh, valuable adjuncts to reduce the trauma and, and damage to the vessels uh, uh, brought over time by aging and the negative effects of cholesterol. It's a, a bit of a seesaw in terms of the cholesterol medications, though. Many patients have reactions to those where they might get muscle aches um, related to the statin medications. And my playbook on that is that the current recommendation for usage of statin medications to reduce the burden of atherosclerotic disease is to keep the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, under 70. That's probably a little aggressive for uh, general prophylaxis and general treatment. So if you can keep your, your LDL cholesterol around 100, I think you still gain a lot of benefit without sort of incurring as much risk for muscle aches and, and joint aches with that. Um, the uh, other medications that have been used in the past, um, uh, such as doxycycline, for example, to reduce inflammation in the blood vessels, um, probably is not worthwhile to take on a daily basis. Um, it hasn't been proven effective, um, and I, obviously there's research ongoing to try and identify other medications that can be taken on a daily basis that could help restore um, uh, structural integrity of the blood vessel wall, or at least um, support uh, uh, a healthy blood vessel over a long period of time. Uh, lastly, uh, general medical care, such as management of hypertension, is very important. Um, I think getting a blood pressure down in the range of 110 to 130 systolic um, is a good medicine um, for all patients, not just patients with EDS, and can certainly stave off the risk of aneurysm formation and arterial dissection. Is vascular EDS always evident from the beginning, or can it present later in life? So um, vascular EDS, um, in terms of uh, how patients present with that. Uh, approximately 20% of patients will have had a vascular event of some sort by age 30, uh, around 80% by age 40. Um, so yes, it can absolutely present um, in the 30s and 40s, but relatively uncommonly, or I would say extremely uncommonly, will vascular DS uh, become evident when people are in their 50s and 60s. Usually by then, things have sort of declared themselves. Uh, there's definitely a um, I wouldn't call it a bias, but a lean, at least, um, to um, you know, young men and young males um, in their teens and early 20s uh, having a, a bit of a rush of vascular manifestations and vascular crises um, that, that um, is of concern. And uh, my, my general take on the fact that men seem to get into trouble with vascular DS ahead of women might have something to do with the fact that the growth trajectory and the testosterone surge as part of um, uh, male puberty is probably leading to a lot of muscle gains and and growth that um, puts additional stress on the vessels. There's, of course, no way to get around that, but it bears mentioning that if someone has a family history of vascular EDS, that the, the teenage boy and the early 20s uh, young man are people that need to be watched very closely. Are dilated veins associated with EDS? There's a, a general, um, so dilated veins in the simplest of uh, clinical manifestations are what we call varicose veins. So these are the veins that um, are more commonly seen in women than in men. Um, usually in the legs, uh, evident is sort of uh, bulging or ropey appearing veins under the skin. Um, uh, they can be associated with uh, pain um, and phlebitis uh, when they get clots in them and, and uh, as, well as, as well as looking somewhat unsightly. So varicose veins are definitely seen in vascular EDS, but they're also seen in uh, other EDS subtypes too. Um, there's no strict direct association between varicose veins um, and the um, non-vascular EDS subtypes, but I have definitely appreciated that they do occur and they can be treated very easily with uh, modern technologies similar to what I discussed in terms of uh, catheter procedures versus 
surgical procedures to remove or address the same veins. Can a vertebral artery dissection heal itself? Um, most arterial dissections, um, uh, most being, uh, I'd say, 80 to 90 percent, uh, will not heal. Um, they will essentially stabilize as a chronically dissected blood vessel. And vertebral arteries are one of the vessels that we do see um, a bit of a crosstalk between vascular DS um, and other potential diagnoses, such as fibromuscular dysplasia, which is known to have an incidence of vertebral artery dissection. The nice thing about vertebral arteries is that they're paired. There is a right vertebral artery and a left vertebral artery. Um, and so those two vessels um, run up the back side of our necks on the right and left side. They join to become a single blood vessel right as they enter into the skull base. Um, and so if you lose one vertebral artery, you still have the other one that could take up the slack. So many patients experience vertebral dissections um, as a neck pain and soreness um, uh, with uh, relatively rarely um, you know, strict neurologic symptoms uh, or uh, fear for stroke because the other vertebral artery can take up the slack and help protect the brain if one of them is dissected. Do you see venous genosis in EDS patients? Um, in EDS patients, uh, we've seen uh, some patients with venous stenosis. Um, the more common uh, venous situations we see um, in EDS patients, not vascular EDS patients, but classical and hypermobile, um, uh, is things such as nutcracker syndrome or pelvic congestion syndrome. Um, uh, less commonly, we see things like jugular vein stenosis, which of course uh, gains some fame uh, with a concern that this had a, poss a link to multiple sclerosis, but that's never really panned out um, a few years down the road from the report of that phenomenon. So venous stenosis can occur, but it's relatively rare. How important is it to have genetic testing done to confirm, to confirm vascular if it is suspected? Can it just be treated without this addition to your chart? Um, the, that's a, it's a difficult question to answer, um, because I think there is a, a concern sometimes regarding, um, uh, insurance coverage, benefits, things of that nature. Um, so that's certainly a conversation that I would defer to your local genetic counselor. Um, uh, genetic testing for, um, for all connective tissue disorders um, has certainly become easier than it was in the past. It used to be several thousand dollars, usually took a blood test, uh, you know, a great degree of logistical coordination to make it all happen. Um, uh, nowadays, um, you know, the ability to get a genetic test is much cheaper, uh, probably only a tenth of that cost and only takes a swab um, on your cheek, uh, not unlike Ancestry.com or 23andMe. So it's a the bar on genetic testing has become uh, much easier to jump over, but whether or not genetic testing should be performed or how value would be, valuable it would be is certainly a consideration to discuss with one's own genetic counselor. Um, we actually had a question on 23andMe. Um, does, is that a reliable source? Would you consider that a reliable way to diagnose vascular EDS? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't. And I think it's the reasons are is that we, it's not going to have the same amount of um, uh, quality control um, and, and information provided to you um, uh, to, to go at that uh, diagnosis. So I think it's a useful thing for um, families uh, to consider, um, but I'm not sure I would uh, rely on 23andMe for guiding med significant medical care. What are your recommend? This is two part. What are your recommendations for screening young children ages three and five with vascular EDS? And are there any um, interventions that you recommend at that young and young of an age for if they do test positive? Yeah. So most um, very very young children, it's not logistically feasible to do a lot of testing just because. Um, you know, they won't sit still for MRIs. You certainly don't want to expose young children to unnecessary medical radiation that they would receive on a CAT scan. So generally, and, and then of course, um, vascular manifestations are exquisitely rare um, in 
uh, in people um, in their first and second uh, decade of life. So I don't feel that there's a, a strong recommendation for early screening. I think that um, you know, when the child is old enough to understand the implications and be manageable without sedation or general anesthesia to get a test performed, such as an MRI, then at that point, it's uh, worthwhile to do for screening. But our general um, strategy is to um, do a screening study, usually in their teens. Um, and if that study is entirely negative, the next check wouldn't be for another five years at least. You mentioned rupture. Um, specifically a patient after pregnancy, what can be done to mitigate vascular risks when considering pregnancy? Um, so pregnancy, there's a, a, a couple general risks that of course are not easily modifiable. One is that um, as part of the um, process of the um, uterus enlarging, the fetus enlarging and the blood vessel demand, the um, blood volume that women carry during pregnancy does increase by about 35% um, um, through the trimesters. Um, you know, patients generally become um, a little bit faster in terms of heart rate also, which is um, also putting additional stress on the blood vessels. And at least experimentally, there's a suggestion that um, after delivery, there are um, you know, biochemical events that are set in place um, you know, related to potentially breastfeeding or the recovery of the mother after delivery that could also then set the stage for a risk for arterial dissection. Um, all that being said, um, you know, the decision for pregnancy and the um, risk of an arterial dissection um, has to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So, you know, working with a experienced genetic counselor or an experienced uh, obstetrics team is really important in that regard to have the safest possible pregnancy as well as delivery. In general, what exercises might be beneficial and which might be avoided by someone with vascular EDS? So, um, the for patients with really any form of connective tissue disorder or any form of an inherited cardiovascular disorder, um, the general recommendations are to avoid, um, you know, high intensity, uh, high output types of activities. So the the classic one that I worry about is, for example, the the young soccer player or the the someone playing tennis, where it's essentially sprint and stop and sprint and stop. But that's not to say that all exercise isn't the same. Um, you know, I think a low to medium level output, 45 to 60 minutes a day um, of uh, steady state cardiovascular, cardiovascular exercise is absolutely good for the patient, helps control weight, keeps their metabolism healthy. Um, you know, the, the um, it's good for their overall cardiovascular health. Um, and so my patients, I recommend that they engage in, you know, brisk walking, light jogging, swimming, uh, biking on relatively level surfaces. Um, all of those forms of exercise are great. And if uh, someone decides to uh, take medications such as beta blockers to help control their heart rate and blood pressure, then I would only suggest that we um, have patients wear heart rate monitors, you know, things such as Fitbit um, and other wearable heart rate monitors are useful um, to help make sure that while you're exercising over that 45 to 60 minutes that you're maintaining a reasonable heart rate um, over a very, very wide range of uh, heart rate, blood pressure stays relatively stable and really only at the extreme end of heart rates where you're 80 to 90 percent of max does the blood pressure really, really take off um, and become high and dangerous. So, you know, a, a moderate level of exercise with a controlled or monitored heart rate is a safe way to address, um, you know, one's overall cardiovascular health and stay fit um, in the long run. What are some of the significant clinical signs and symptoms that someone would be would need to be genetically tested to rule out or to confirm vascular? Um, so, um, you know, a strong family history of arterial rupture or arterial or aortic dissection um, would be a concern. Um, generally, um, you know, cardiovascular events, um, particularly aortic um, rupture, uh, aortic dissection, vascular rupture are very rare in patients who are under 40 years of age and exquisitely rare in patients who are under 30 years of age. 
So the presence uh, in the family of a of a relative, you know, a, a first degree relative, that is, you know, someone, a brother, a sister, a mother, a father who had an arterial rupture, an arterial dissection, um, you know, under uh, age 30 and possibly under age 40, um, do suggest um, that genetic testing could be worthwhile. Um, you know, again, uh, an, ex an evaluation by an experienced genetics team is of great value. Um, uh, sometimes uh, when considering one diagnosis, the one's own physical manifestations may point towards another diagnosis. And these days, as genetic medicine continues to refine and uh, become more um, advanced, we're now seeing genetic testing over, you know, overlapping several different mutations um, and uh, sorting out which of those different genetic mutations has the most importance to the patient is certainly well within the range of a genetic medicine expert. Do seizures relate to vascular EDS? There's no direct um, link between seizures and vascular EDS that I'm aware of. Um, of course, the presence of seizures will usually lead to some um, uh, imaging of the brain to rule out um, uh, arterial problems or even tumors. And so an MRI or a CT scan to evaluate the head around the time of a seizure will usually answer the question in a uh, pretty straightforward fashion as to whether or not there's even a vascular uh, pre uh, issue present in the brain. What about chronic CSF leak? Is that tied to vascular EDS? There's no direct uh, evidence that the the dura, which is the lining around our brain and spinal column, um, is uh, is weakened significantly with um, with vascular EDS. Um, other EDS subtypes, um, I'm not aware of a direct causal link either. For a patient in their 30s that has been diagnosed with vascular EDS, what signs and symptoms are concerning enough that you need to discuss them with your doctor when they present to you? Um, many patients with vascular EDS will have some you know, ongoing low to medium level of pain related to things such as fascial tears. So we know that the you know, tendinous structures, the muscular structures in vascular EDS do have some weakening. That weakening can be manifest as uh, muscle tears and tendon tears um, that oftentimes um, you know will be quite painful for a few hours at a time and can even be disabling in the long run. Um, you know those types of pains that come and go within a couple hours um, that are in the spectrum of what people have experienced before um, is usually not concerning for vascular rupture. A pain that is um, not typical for one to have um, that's associated with lightheadedness. Um, is certain, certainly something to take seriously, um, and uh, in most cases, if the you know it doesn't go away within the usual time frame of other pain um, symptoms that people have experienced, and the lightheadedness persists, those are situations that an emergency department visit is probably appropriate. You mentioned pelvic congestion syndrome. Is treatment always indicated, or is there any? time in which it's not needed? The um, uh, pelvic congestion syndrome can have a very wide spectrum of symptoms. Um, and many times the decision to intervene is based upon uh, a quality of life consideration by the patient. So that is, you know, the pain is becoming more severe, um, more disabling, and, and oftentimes that's what tips over the decision to do the procedure. Um, there are uh, certain types of uh, vascular compression and, and um, vascular congestion that could probably be present in almost all of us with relatively little symptoms. So sorting out the, what symptom uh, is bothering the uh, patient, um, you know, how, what's the level of pelvic congestion uh, appreciated, what's the imaging to suggest the link, all of those things have to be uh, considered in the decision for surgery or embolization or an endovascular procedure. Uh, follow up with pelvic congestion. Um, if the pelvic congestion is primarily affecting the uterus, do you recommend a hysterectomy? Um, in many cases, that's not necessary. Um, and uh, there are certainly very good 
um, embolization techniques that can be used to address uh, pelvic congestion. Um, you know, and pelvic congestion is thought um, to lead to significant uh, heavy menses, um, and that's uh, increasingly problematic, then hysterectomy is usually considered as a last resort. Is there a location where a dissection could occur that's not treatable with a stent in a patient with vascular EDS? Uh, yes, um, there are, um, for example, uh, uh, small arterial dissections we sometimes appreciate uh, at the base of the skull where the relatively soft carotid artery goes through the relatively hard skull base. And in that location, dissections are actually quite common in v vascular EDS and a stent in that location is a really, really bad solution because the uh, artery takes a couple right angle turns. And as I mentioned earlier, these stents want to assume a relatively straight conformation. So um, a stent put in that location could most likely lead to more damage than leaving things alone. Uh, so Again, the stent decision is mostly based upon the anatomy where it's feasible and safe. Um, and that has very much to do with what organ is downstream and, and what function has to be preserved. What are your thoughts on Losartan? Uh, so Losartan is a medication that has been uh, approved by the FDA here in the US for I think 35 or 40 years. It's a very safe, anti-hypertensive medication. There is a body of literature um, looking at uh, Losartan and the effects on the blood vessel wall um, that have uh, been fairly convincing in terms of the experimental evidence to suggest that uh, Losartan helps uh, aortic wall biology. Um, uh, but like many things, uh, when put to the test in a randomized controlled trial, uh, Losartan as well as Losartan plus a beta blocker appear to be about the same in terms of preventing um, uh, progression of aneurysm in patients with um, with uh, Marfan syndrome. So I think uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, we find Losartan is a reasonable option for blood pressure control uh, for most of our patients with connective, connective tissue disorder. Um, uh, however, if they're tolerating a beta blocker uh, quite well and they've had no symptoms, uh, or side effects related to the beta blocker, there would not be a reason to add Losartan unless um, there was some uh, reason to believe that beta blocker therapy was uh, was uh, was failing. Are there specific types of musculoskeletal presentations for those with vascular EDS? Uh, there are some uh, criteria uh, uh, through which people begin to consider the diagnosis of vascular EDS, such as uh, flat feet or club feet. Um, tendon ruptures are one of the criteria that we consider for patients with vascular EDS. We, I know from managing many patients in the clinic that you know, those small fascial tears that give people um, body pains and body aches um, are something we see in the, uh, in the disorder also. Is it possible? possible to have vascular EDS and not have very many vascular problems or be mostly asymptomatic? Uh, yes, I think um, across the board there's a, a lot of variation um, in terms of how people present with their various various uh, connective tissue disorders um, or even inside vascular EDS. Um, on average, um, of course, th there is a estimate of um, how events occur and, and when people can get into trouble. But I've certainly appreciated that there are some patients who do much, much better with their um, disorder over the course of decades than others. And that probably has something to do with other family influence or other genetic influences that sort of mix into the family tree generation over generation. What preventative testing do you recommend with vascular patients and on what timetable? Um, so this sort of gets back to an earlier question about testing very, very young children. So I think um, a, a screening examination, uh, you know, head to head through pelvis, um, uh, most often using MRI so you avoid medical radiation is a reasonable uh, recommendation for people in their teens when they're old enough to cooperate with, with such, uh, such tests without having to get sedated or anesthesia, which brings an additional risk. The... Um, you know, if a study is negative, that is no vascular manifestations are found, then the next imaging wouldn't be for five years. 
Um, once vascular abnormalities have been detected, then usually the screening goes to an annual basis. Do you think that people diagnosed with vascular who don't have high blood pressure should be on beta blockers? So um, patients with vascular DS um, uh, in Europe, for example, can receive a beta blocker called Sliprolol. This medication um, is approved in Canada and Europe um, and in a randomized trial appeared to have an improvement uh, in terms of vascular manifestations um, versus uh, other types of uh, beta blocker medications. Um, the trial itself um, was a very good trial, but had some uh, potential issues that would undermine such a conclusion to say that Celeprolol is, is, uh, should be used for everyone. Um, however, there are, uh, there are groups who are now trying to organize a new trial to look at beta blockers in general. Um, in the United States, for patients who have high blood pressure, yes, we will um, initiate um, beta blockers for them. But if someone did not have high blood pressure and did not have vascular manifestations, then um, it's more likely that they would experience side effects related to the beta blocker and might are not likely to benefit from it. So, um, you know, starting a beta blocker um, when someone is otherwise feeling well probably is not um, a, a reasonable first step for them. For people who live far away from you, um, do you have any recommendations to finding a vascular surgeon or a vascular um, expert who might be able to manage their care, especially in those who are outside of major metro areas? So I think you know this is where um, you know the patients, of course, can try and educate their their local providers as to you know what the what the their disorder can bring. Um, you know, what are the things to look out for? Um, you know, in rural environments where transport times can be measured in hours or even days, um, you know, it's always a difficult situation to deal with emergencies. So having a local, you know, vascular surgeon or a local doctor or cardiologist who's, you know, familiar with at least blood pressure control and management of uh, bleeding, um, uh, and can be receptive to questions is uh, is certainly valuable. Uh, but ultimately, most patients with um, EDS and vascular EDS, particularly those vascular EDS patients who've had arterial rupture, will need to be aligned at some point with a major medical center to handle um, problems as they uh, may arise. Do you have any recommendations for resources to help educate those local doctors or ways to get them to be more um, open to learning more um, if there's some resistance there? Um, you know, I think it's hard to it's hard to convince doctors to take on problems that they're not familiar with um, and that's always a rub. Um, I think uh, um, you know there are uh, items from the, the EDS societies that are helpful medical resource guides um, um, you know, medical bracelets, things like that, that are valuable. Um, but ultimately, it does usually take some degree of shopping to sort of find a, a, a doc who will sort of uh, work with you with the disorder. Are upper extremity DVTs common in EDS? Uh, generally, no. Um, I mean, DVT is one of the more common medical conditions uh, that we see in patients inside the hospital for a variety of reasons, but there really isn't a, a strong link between DVT and uh, really any um, connective tissue disorder. Um, we had a couple of questions about, uh, excuse me if I pronounce this wrong, uh, at SIVO, E-D-S-I-V-O. Um, can you talk a little bit about that if you're familiar with it? I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Uh, what about vitamin C and collagen supplements? Could you say anything about that? Is that recommended? So I think the, um, the prior recommendations had included to try vitamin C supplementation and collagen supplementation. Those, it's not really based on any strong data. Um, there is some experimental data looking at vitamin C supplementation for wound healing and, and animal models that suggested a slight benefit, and that sort of has been extrapolated to the, um, the human condition uh, without really much uh, great support. So I don't think that there's a harm on uh, a vitamin supplementation or vitamin C supplementation. Um, I certainly wouldn't 
um, uh, recommend that people spend a lot of money on it because I'm not certain that it's it's going to give them a great benefit. Is there any evidence to correlate vascular EDS with migraines? Um, again, you know, migraines is such a common medical condition that it's uh, hard to to make any strict link with uh, vascular EDS. Uh, I have definitely appreciated vascular EDS patients who have migraines, but it's not a, a commonality in, in my clinical experience. For that, do you have any uh, recommendations for how that might be treated differently or any sort of possible complications from normal migraine treatments? Um, so there's a lot of medications on the market for migraine therapy. Um, many of the migraine um, uh, medications do have some degree of caffeine-like effect, so it's trying to, you know, constrict um, uh, cerebral blood flow on some low level to reduce cerebral blood flow. These things sound kind of scary, but practically speaking, um, uh, it, the extent of reduction of flow through a blood vessel related to these medications is probably not significant from the standpoint of increasing one's risk for arterial rupture or arterial dissection. Um, I think uh, you know regular um, regular use of those medications, particularly if it's associated with raising your blood pressure, is something to be concerned with. So I think most migraine treatments can be used safely, um, but blood pressure should be checked while you're on those migraine treatments. What are some of the warning signs um, that someone might have an arterial rupture? Well, the, in the abdominal aorta, for example, where the abdominal aortic aneurysms are probably one of the most common aneurysms that we see uh, in, in people. And the most common misdiagnosis of a abdominal aortic aneurysm leaking is when people call it a kidney stone because aneurysm pain of leakage or aneurysm rupture pain is quite similar to what people experience with kidney stones. So pulsing, throbbing pain that's really severe. So on a scale of one to 10, these are your nine, 10, 11 out of 10 uh, levels of pain, pulsing, throbbing, usually sort of start um, you know, in the middle of the back, radiate out to the flanks, uh, sometimes down to the groin, again, associated with lightheadedness. Um, those are those are of uh, would be symptoms I would take quite seriously. So you know, high level, highly severe pulsing, throbbing pain that radiates um, out across the chest, the abdomen is is one to take quite seriously. You know, uh, the type of pain that people experience it can be very severe. Also, is just the regular pain of lifting something too heavy or shoveling too much snow or raking too many leaves. That's sort of pain. You know, people generally feel associated with that activity. Pain that comes out of nowhere associated with that severe level of pain is a concern. Do people with vascular have, take longer time to heal from injury or dislocations? Um, scar formation in patients with vascular DS um, or other EDS sub, uh, subtypes can be abnormal. So there probably is some relative delay of um, of a healing or recovery after surgery compared to those without uh, EDS, but it's um, you know not going to be that significant in terms of a delay. I would estimate you know weeks versus um, you know a, a slight delay of a few days to a week uh, or two, not uh, measured in months. Do people with vascular EDS ever present with weakened bones? Uh, generally, no. I'm not familiar with that. Does water intake affect vascular EDS? Um, only to the standpoint of people who have um, a history of hypertension who are not well hydrated tend to have blood pressure that is very uh, labile, or as we would say, up and down. For uh, people with hypermobile EDS or um, just in general, what is a normal aortic root measure? And what is when uh, the number, number in which someone might need to be concerned? So generally, um, aortic root measurements do have some relationship to body surface area. So height and weight are important in the consideration. Um, you know, generally speaking, uh, when we start to see aortic roots um, 
getting over 45 millimeters in size. Those are roots that pro probably need more regular monitoring uh, by an experienced cardiologist or cardiac surgeon. Is difficult venipuncture or easily collapsed veins associated or indicative of vascular EDS? Uh, not necessarily. Um, we certainly know that uh, vascular EDS patients have um, a propensity for varicose veins, uh, but that doesn't necessarily imply that they can't be cannulated for regular IVs. And um, our last question, we're nearing the end of our webinar. If one parent is positive for vascular EDS, what are the genetic probability for the offspring to also have genetic EDS? Uh, to have, I'm sorry, vascular EDS. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, um, the gene is passed 50% uh, of the time. Um, uh, depending upon, um, and, th and this is an area of, uh, I think that we're working with emerging research, the you know, the effects of the other parent in terms of the, the, the gene effects and how people manifest their genes is definitely something that um, we're working on and studying here at Hopkins. Um, there are probably influences um, that help or even hurt um, the gene as it passes from one parent to another um, that are fed in from the other parent. So, um, you know, generation to generation, um, where someone might have done quite well or quite poorly with a particular mutation, once you bring in the new gene pool from the new parent coming into the family tree, uh, sometimes things can get a little bit better. So, you know, that's where, um, you know, regular surveillance and regular appointments with an experienced team can be helpful to help people appreciate that over time. Thank you so much, Dr. Black. You gave a whole lot of information and answered a lot of questions. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. Sure. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, for those who have joined us late or just want to take in all this information even more, we will have a recording available on our website and our YouTube page that will probably go up within the next couple of weeks. You can watch our social media for that announcement. Thank you all for attending and have a great day. Good night.